This is Unit 1, Lecture 4, Epistemology. Epistemology is the philosophy of knowledge. If this were a course on the philosophy of knowledge, we would dive deeply into at least four questions. What is the difference between knowledge and belief? What is the difference between rationalism and empiricism? What is the difference between skepticism and certainty? And what is truth? Concerning knowledge versus belief, we can begin by recognizing that in ordinary English, knowledge implies certainty and belief does not. If I said I know my first name is Christopher, but I don't believe it, that would be odd. You might say, if you're not sure, then you don't know it. On the other hand, if I said I believe it's going to rain, but I'm not sure, that makes perfectly good sense. So it's apparent that knowledge and belief are different. But if they're different, how can we know something and believe it at the same time? That seems to imply that I am both certain of it and not certain of it at the same time. Perhaps it's possible to know something but be wrong. The theor that theory is called fallibilism, and it insists on just that. But again, that seems odd to say that I know my name is Christopher, but I could be wrong. Maybe knowledge is just belief of a certain type. In philosophy, we often hear that knowledge is justified true belief. If I believe something and I'm justified in believing it and it's true, then I must know it. I believe it's going to rain tonight and I'm justified in believing it because all the weather stations are saying so, and the clouds are roiling outside, and the barometer is falling, and lo and behold, it rains. I must know it. So we're still left to wonder, what is the difference between knowledge and belief? We'll have plenty of occasion to bring this up again as we go through the course. Rationalism versus empiricism to many people is the fundamental question in philosophy. It has to do with how we acquire knowledge. Do we acquire it through reason alone, as the rationalist says, or do we acquire it through sense experience, as the empiricist says? The word empirical is related to words like experiment and experience. According to the empiricist, if you can't taste it, touch it, see it, hear it, or smell it, you can't know it. Consider the problem posed by Mr. Molyneux some 300 years ago. Molyneux says, imagine a man who's been blind since birth. He can tell the difference by touch between a sphere and a cube of roughly the same size and material. Now, if he suddenly received his sight, could he immediately tell the difference by sight alone without touching the sphere and cube, which was which? The rationalist would say yes, because the man already had the concepts of cube and spherness in his mind prior to any sense experience. The empiricist would say no, because he would have to be taught the connection between what feels like a cube or sphere and what looks like a cube or sphere. Then there's skepticism versus certainty. Skepticism is the view that we cannot know anything. We said earlier that knowledge implies certainty, at least in ordinary English. If knowledge implies certainty and we can never be certain of anything, then apparently we can never know anything. On the other hand, the anti-skeptic says that there is common sense and we can be logically certain. For example, as you're listening to my voice, you know that either I have a mustache or I don't. You may not know which one, but you know it has to be one or the other. You're absolute, absolutely certain that it's one or the other. That's logical certainty. And then quite problematically for the skeptic is that it seems contradictory to say, I am certain that I don't know anything. So the skeptic has a lot of work to do to convince us that we can't know anything. And frankly, between you and me, I don't think the skeptic will succeed. This gets us to truth. You remember when Pilate asked Jesus what is truth and Jesus remained silent? That was a wise move. We have at least five basic theories of truth, correspondence, coherence, pragmatic, performative, and metaphorical. According to correspondence theory, a sentence is true if it corresponds to the facts and it's false if it contradicts the facts. And if you can't find a fact, you have got to suspend judgment. But what if we disagree about whether something's a fact? We can agree, for example, depending on what time of day it is that you are listening to this, that the sun is shining in your neighborhood or that the sun is not shining. That's a correspondence kind of statement. It's true if the sun is shining, and it's false if the sun is not shining. But suppose we start asking other kinds of questions, like, for example, is the consecrated host the body of Jesus Christ? That's not something you can determine by looking, tasting, touching, hearing, or smelling. So we need a second theory of truth. This gets us to the coherence theory. According to this theory, a sentence is true if it's coherent within a system of belief. So if you tell me you're a Roman Catholic and you believe the consecrated host is the body of Jesus Christ, I'm going to say, you're right. 
You can't be a Roman Catholic and deny transubstantiation at the same time. It would be a contradiction. If, on the other hand, you said that you're an observant Orthodox Jew and you believe that the consecrated host is the body of Jesus Christ, I'm going to tell you you're wrong because to a Jew that statement is false. This works in one sense because it doesn't require us all to find a fact on which we agree. It only requires that we be consistent within our system of belief. But you could have disagreements within a system between two different people. Lord knows there's plenty of disagreement between Christians about some of the fundamental tenets of belief. You can also have a situation where one person holds contradictory views. Somebody who is logical on the whole, but is also superstitious at the same time, for example. So it looks like we need yet another theory of truth to add to our toolbox of truths. This gets us to the pragmatic theory, which says that a sentence is true if it works to regard it as true. In 1600, if I said humans can fly in heavier than air aircraft, that statement would have been false. If I say it in the 21st century, that statement is true. But what works for one person might not work for another person. Suppose, for example, I say wine is good for you. Well, if you only have a little and it makes you feel a little better, that's fine. But if you're an alcoholic, it's not. So the concept of workability is problematic. You've noted, perhaps, that we've moved progressively from an objective theory of truth, the correspondence theory, which is about facts in the universe, to a subjective theory of truth, which has more to do with ourselves as we're saying something is true or false. So that in the coherence theory, my choice of a belief system is subjective. Whether I choose to be Christian or Jewish or atheist is up to me. Now, once I've made the choice, I have certain objective responsibilities. Once I choose to be Roman Catholic, for example, I have to believe in transubstantiation. But as we move to the pragmatic theory, it's even more subjective because what works for me may not work for you. Then we get to the performative theory, which says truth is merely what you believe it is. That's it. Nothing more, nothing less. So to say this is true is to say I accept it, period. That's wholly subjective. The primary objection is it might be too subjective, because if I say I believe I'm a 10-foot hairy concert pianist, I can say it all I want, but it's simply not true. There are people, including within Christian circles, who will make the case that truth is performative. Finally, there's metaphorical truth. I think there's a lot more of this in our lives, and especially in our faith, than we often accept or indicate. So to say jealousy is a green-eyed monster, for example, is metaphorically true, even though it's not literally true. But I wonder whether there isn't much that we hold to be true in the Bible that's also metaphorically true but not historically true. Certainly the first cousin of a metaphor would be a fable or a parable, which is really metaphor with a plot. So for example, when Jesus tells the story of the prodigal son, he's telling us a truth, a very deep truth, but it's not necessarily an historical truth. So let's keep this whole set of five truths in mind as we work through our course, wondering what's true and what isn't. This is the end. This is the end of the introductory lecture on epistemology. Next, a look at ethics.